pick back up where we left off, you're going to see something very interesting. Uh, it's kind of what we call progressive revelation. Daniel did not get all of his revelation at once uh, for future things, and that's probably a good thing because you saw how it affected him last time. He, uh, he was distraught terribly, and as you're going to see this time, he is so upset that he lays in bed sick for days with this portion that he gets. And so that's um, the attitude we need to go at this with. And it's, again, we talked about it last week, it's not room, there's no room for pride, there's no room for arrogance and eschatology. Um, we have to be humble in this and we have to see it for what it is. Um, it's a very serious study and it's not a study that should scare people. We shouldn't use it to terrify people. Instead, it should motivate us. All right, so that's the whole point. This kind of study should motivate us. So, a quick review from where we started. Daniel had a vision in chapter 7 that was similar to the vision in chapter 2, which we didn't cover. We covered some time ago, basically about the kingdoms. Uh, Daniel knows now that there's four kingdoms throughout the history of man that are represented in this eschatological view. Uh, Daniel was able to identify the first kingdom already. First kingdom's Babylon. Uh, he's living during that day. And the king of Babylon is his king. Daniel was troubled by the fourth beast, given in chapter 7. He knows that is a future kingdom. Uh, he knows that's the last kingdom. And so he's getting these pieces. He knows already that there's going to be ten leaders that are going to rise up in the last kingdom. He already knows that one is going to be stronger than the others and run three of them off. And he's really going to take over. We were introduced to that little horn with the eyes and the mouth last week. So we got a taste, just a taste, of the Antichrist. Um, we're going to get more of that tonight. He's going to develop that thought even further. And so that's why, again, this is progressive. So that's what Daniel knows so far. And two years later, after that vision, he's going to have another one, which is going to build on it. So let's go there. Daniel chapter 8, if you're not already there, I will read it, and uh, then we'll have this discussion about it. Chapter 8, verse 1, Daniel. During the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, saw another vision following the one that I had already, had already appeared to me. In this vision, I was at the fortress of Susa in the province of Elam, standing beside the Uli River. As I looked up, I saw a ram with two long horns standing beside the river. One of the horns was longer than the other, even though it had grown later than the one, than the other one. The ram butted everything out of his way to the west, to the north, to the south, and no one could stand against him to help his victims, or help his victims. He did as he pleased and became very great. While I was watching, suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. This goat, which had one very large horn between his eyes, headed toward the two-horned ram and I had seen standing beside the river, rushing at him in a rage. The goat charged furiously at the ram and struck him, breaking off both his horns. Now the ram was helpless, and the goat knocked him down and trampled him. No one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. The goat became very powerful. But at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. In the large horn's place grew four prominent horns, pointing in the four directions of the earth. Then from one of the prominent horns came a small horn, whose power was very great. It extended toward the south and the east, and toward the glorious land of Israel. Its power reached to the heavens, where it attacked the heavenly army, throwing some of the heavenly beings and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. It even challenged the commander of heaven's army by canceling the daily sacrifices offered to him and by destroying his temple. The army of heaven was restrained from responding to this rebellion, so the daily sacrifice was halted and truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. Then I heard two holy ones talking to each other. One of them asked, How long will the events of this vision last? How long will the rebellion that causes desecration stop the daily sacrifices? How long will the temple and heaven's army be trampled on? The other replied, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the temple will be made right again. As I, Daniel, was trying to understand the meaning of this vision, someone who looked like a man stood in front of me. And I heard a human voice calling out from the Uli River, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of this vision. 
As Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Son of man, he said, you must understand that the events you have seen in your vision relate to the time of the end. While he was taught or speaking, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. But Gabriel roused me with a touch and helped me to my feet. Then he said, I am here to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. What you have seen pertains to the very end of time. The two-horned ram represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy male goat represents the king of Greece. And the large horn between his eyes represents the first king of the Greek Empire. The four prominent horns that replace the one large horn show that the Greek Empire will break into four kingdoms, but none as great as the first. At the end of their rule, when their sin is at its height, a fierce king, a master of the tree, will rise to power. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause a shocking amount of destruction and succeed in everything he does. He will destroy powerful leaders and devastate the holy people. He will be a master of deception and will become arrogant. He will, be destroy, he will destroy many without warning. He will even take on the prince of princes in battle, but he will be broken, though not by human power. This vision about the 2,300 evenings and mornings is true, but none of these things will happen for a long time, so keep this vision a secret. Then I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for several days. Afterward, I got up and performed my duties for the king, but I was greatly troubled by the vision and could not understand it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the words of Daniel that have been preserved for us for this day. Uh, Father, most of these things have happened in the past, but there is some important encouragement that we can learn from them. And so, Father, I pray that you challenge our hearts tonight. May we understand just as Daniel saw it uh, so that we can apply these things in our own lives. We love you and we thank you. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, again, Daniel has dated his writing. It's nice of him to do that. Uh, this vision came two years later, so this is 551 B.C. We know that for a fact. Uh, let's look at the first animal and we'll see something very important. This vision starts with the second empire. It doesn't start with the first empire that we started with last time. It actually starts with the second. And it appears this vision is given for two reasons. It's to solidify the identity of the second and third kingdoms. And it's to introduce more information about the Antichrist. That's what really this passage is for. So let's start with the vision. The author is really nice to us. He gives vision interpretation again. So he lays it out really in a logical form, which Scripture is not always laid out that way. So the first thing that we see, the first beast, all right? The first piece is a ram with two horns. We got that description. I, I like when you slow down and really study these. Sometimes they get confusing. But when you look and step back and see how descriptive this is. You got a ram. It's got two horns. Uh, there's a first horn that's there. And then there's a second horn that grows that's even longer. That, that's very descriptive. Okay, And it does describe an historical kingdom. We're going to talk about that. Thankfully, he actually gets the answer for that. Okay, the second beast is a goat with only one horn, uh, and he is so swift he doesn't even touch the ground. You remember the leopard with wings? Okay, swift is there. He breaks the horn off. He's replaced by four. How many heads did the leopard have? Four. Clearly, you can see these two beasts go with the same kingdom. Okay? Uh, now, we see this last one, and it is a little bit different from the little horn we saw the last time. We get another little horn that comes out of this. Um, this little horn does not have a mouth. It does not have eyes, so it is different. Uh, but you do notice he sets his eyes on the glorious land of Israel. This is important because it's historic, as we're going to discuss. Um, there's something very critical here. He comes out of the goat, not the fourth beast. Okay, so pay attention to that. The last little horn came out of the future beast, the fourth one. This little horn came out of the third beast, or the third kingdom. Okay? So there is a difference here. There's a big difference here that you've got to catch. This is a historic leader, not a future leader. But it does have future implications, and I'll talk about that. Okay? So let's talk about, there's the picture, uh, artist's rendition of what this might look like. You've got the, the ram with the two horns, one longer than the other. Uh, you've got the goat, or the he-goat, the male goat, as the scripture tells us, the shaggy goat, uh, that is attacking and just decimates the ram. Now, the interpretation, the first one, we don't have to stretch on this one, 
Last time we had to do some figuring. This time, the guy tells him who it is. He's like, Daniel, this is the Medes and the Persians, all right? Uh, and, and it makes sense with the beast itself. The Medes and the Persians, two empires. The Medes were the fierce warriors. And they were the ones initially in this, um, this pairing that had the strength. They were the ones that really established the kingdom. But later, the Persians rose up and became stronger. That's why that horn, the second horn, was longer. So later in their reign, the Persians really held up the empire. That describes the picture of the ram with the two horns. Okay? So again, it's a historical kingdom. He does live into this kingdom. He gets to live and see this kingdom start. But that's all he gets to see. The rest of this is in the future for him. And he's not going to see because it's hundreds of years later. All right? The second beast is the Greek Empire. I mean, think about it. How would they even know the Greeks were coming? This is 300, a couple hundred years, at least 300 years before it happened. And so this is definitely foretold. This is something that Daniel's like, who are the Greeks? <laughs> who are the Greeks if they don't exist? He's told, this is the Greek Empire. You remember the one horn? Who is the one horn? Uh, that's the little horn. Who's the big horn, the initial big horn? Thank you. Alexander the Great. We talked about him last week. He comes in. Whoosh. He just takes over. He's so fast. Again, that's the, that's the rapid we see in this flight. He just covered everything really, really fast. But then what happened to him? He died young. He, he died prematurely. And, and he was replaced ultimately by breaking up the kingdom into four parts. And we see that again today. We remember what the four parts were. Uh, the four parts, oh, let me go back. The four parts uh, were, I didn't put this on there, Lassicimus, or Lassicimus, uh, Cassander, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. So we know very specifically, this is a reiteration of the last vision. We know very clearly it's talking about the same kingdoms. So we're not guessing. Daniel knew that this was the Greek Empire, and he gets it identified very clearly. Uh, to us, they're really, unless you just like history, they're not that important. What is important is that we, we pay attention to the fact that Daniel did not know who the Greeks were going to be. And so when Daniel is prophesying this, when did this happen? 551 B.C. The Greeks don't come in until the 3rd century. And so since this, we can look back and see it's fulfilled, we have confidence in prophecy. That's what we gain when we study these things. We can look back and say, oh wow, that, yeah, that makes sense. That's the Medes and the Persians. We can look back, you know, again and say, wow, that, that's the Greeks. That's Alexander the Great. That's the four satraps and the four kings that came out of his reign. Wow, okay. So definitely, he was right on. So that means he's right on with the rest of the things that he says. Okay. So, just to note, we currently live in the period between the goats, the Greek Empire, and the final empire. That's what we're living in. It's known as several different things. The time of the gen period of the Gentiles. The church age, it's called. It's the 69th week of Daniel. We'll get there. It's coming. Uh, so there are different terms for this, but we live between the Greek Empire and the final empire, which, like we talked last time, may be a Roman Empire, but we do know it's a world empire. It's clearly a world empire. All right? So notice something. The verse 23 sets the timing for the little horn. Uh, it doesn't seem that the, it's not the same as the horn in chapter 7, because verse 23 says, At the end of their rule, at the end of the rule of those four kings that we met last time, that's when this horn rises up. So it's definitely something that's happened in the past. So the little horn's a powerful king that has come up from the third empire. The Stalin's already mentioned Antiochus Epiphanes. We're going to talk a lot more about him in chapter 13. Um, but he is the little horn that rises up. Um, he comes into power in the Greek world about 175 B.C. Notice we're getting closer to the time of Christ. Right? Um, he, he ruled the Seleucid Empire. That's the portion of the empire that he had. He hated the Jews. We've seen that throughout the course of history. He hated the Jews. He actually outlawed the Jewish religion. He said, you are no longer going to circumcise your males. You're no longer going to sacrifice and he goes in and he just desecrates the temple. He sacrifices what? A pig. Why is that desecration? Because it's unclean. 
It's an unclean animal by Jewish law. He takes an unclean animal into the temple area and on the altar, he sacrifices it. That just desecrates it. Okay, just, just ruins things. And so he sets a stake in the ground. Uh, in December of 167 BC, he does that by sacrificing the pig. Uh, and this is, again, the end of their worship. He stops the Jewish worship in 167 BC. They can't worship anymore. Now, you've probably heard of Hanukkah, right? You know when Hanukkah is, right? It's December. Uh, you, most of you probably know a little bit about it. This is neat. Um, Antiochus didn't kill all of the Jews. He killed a lot of them. He killed the Orthodox Jews. But there were those who fell in line with him. And this is what's spooky. There were those who were liberal. All right? And so they're like, well, I can die or I can marry up with the current ruler. All right? Church marries the state. Church always becomes the harlot, by the way. And so basically the Jews married up to the leader, Antiochus. And they became what's called Hellenistic Jews. That's where you get the term. They're Jews that bought into the Greek style of living. The me-centered style of living. So I, it's kind of oxymoronic to have a Hellenistic Jew. But that's what happened. So you get some Hellenistic Jews. And they're allowing idol worship. They're allowing Greek idol worship in the temple area. They're allowing Jerusalem right, to fall right back into idol worship. Which they said they would never do. Our God is one God. After the Babylonian captivity, when we get back, this is never going to happen again. Well, guess what? It happens again in the first century B.C. And so they start falling into line. Well, a man named Mattathias Maccabee, all right, you've heard of Maccabee and Revol Revolt. But Mattathias decided this wasn't going to work. And so he kills one of the Hellenistic Jews that is preparing to set an idol, or right, worship an idol. That starts the revolt. Mattathias takes his sons and they retreat and they go out and stay in hiding. He dies a year later, but his son Judah Maccabee, he leads the revolution that goes against Antiochus. And by guerrilla warfare, they're able to run him out. Right? And that's what this is all about. That's what Hanukkah is all about. Um, Mattathias dies in 166. By December of 164, temple worship is restored because his son Judah Maccabee leads this revolt. And they're successful. Right? They are successful. Now, um, that's, the, that's the story behind it. Tradition says that they found a jug of oil, right, the right oil for the menorah to burn, because that was a part of their worship when they restored the temple worship. But they only had enough for one day. But God touched it, blessed it. How long did it last? Eight days. Thank you, Kara. That's why Hanukkah is eight days long. Because the oil lasted eight days. So it's a celebration of the Maccabean revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, the little horn. Okay? The little horn. Now, how long did he stop temple worship? Three years. A little over three years. What was the number given in the text twice? 2,300 evenings and mornings. Two sacrifices a day leaves 1,150 days. And so the little horn stopped temple worship for a little over three years. 1150 days. It's been fulfilled. Everything that happened here, we know historically, has been fulfilled. Okay? So, clearly, he was a type of Antichrist. He's not the Antichrist. That's why I have the, uh, the, the title or subtitle on there. Um, it's important to see that. He is an Antichrist, but he's not the Antichrist. There have been many throughout human history. Uh, thought of another one, Jim Jones was a type of Antichrist. He was a man who rose up in power, was able to convince people, again, uh, to drink the Kool-Aid, literally, uh, and he used his power for death and destruction. As we talked last week, Hitler was an Antichrist. Um, Hitler was able to rise up to power and abuse that power to uh, decimate the Jews. Uh, so, throughout the course of history, just like Antiochus Epiphanes, there have been multiple little a Antichrists. But, there's something in this passage, there's three things in this passage that tells us that it's a dual prophecy. Right? A dual fulfillment. If you've never heard that term, a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament were dual fulfillment. They had a current fulfillment, but they also had implications for something that was going to happen in the future. And that was a Semitic way of writing. They did that. They had dual purposes or dual fulfillments. And so this is a dual fulfillment prophecy. You get the one that definitely happened, right? 167 to 164, you get one pointing towards the Antichrist. So, 
he is going to get some more information about the Antichrist. So let's talk about the Antichrist. Okay? We are cruising. Now, as I've said many times, I am a literal interpreter of Scripture. Scripture means what it says. And it means what the author intended by the leading of the Holy Spirit for the audience he intended. All right? It's just been preserved for us. And that's what we have to figure out. We have to glean what we take from it. What the author intended was to identify Antiochus Epiphanes. Period. That's what the author intended. But there is some language here that you cannot resolve. Because he says, at the time of the end. At the time of the end. You notice, he tells you, wait a minute. These things are happening at the time of the end. And so there are a couple of things that he mentions that are clearly related to the capital A Antichrist. There's no question that they did relate to Antiochus Epiphanes, but they also relate to the Antichrist. The first is that his power comes from Satan. All right? His power does not come from himself. His power comes from somewhere else. In other words, uh, there was more to him than meets the eye. And you have to think about it. How in the world do you get people... To support, in Antiochus' case, to support your cause to exterminate people. How in the world can you convince people to follow that? Well, you can use fear, but these Hellenistic Jews were given up willingly. How do you get people who supposedly know God's word to actually follow you to go against God's people? That kind of stings, but some of you get that. There has to be a power behind that. That's not human. Right? There has to be a, a bigger power. Basically, uh, Satan has his minions. Satan has his agents. And Antiochus Epiphanes was a good agent of Satan. Very clearly. He's the force behind him. Uh, Satan hates the worship of God. Obviously, that's why he fell from heaven. Because he thought he needed to be worshipped. He didn't want God to be worshipped. And so here he gets a victory. For three years, he is able to stop the worship of God from his holy people. So Satan had to laugh when that pig was sacrificed on that altar. He had a victory. It's a temporary one, but he had a victory because he had a willing agent. And that willing agent was Antiochus Epiphanes. Same is true with Jim Jones. All right? No pun intended, but how in the world did he convince, convince people to drink Kool-Aid that would kill him? How do you convince people to follow you when you're that way? There's a power behind that. There's a darker... That, that power doesn't come from himself. There's a deeper, darker power. Satan had to be behind it. Uh, he found a willing agent to make a mockery of Christianity because what, what was Jim Jones's group called? What are they? Disciples of Christ. Have you ever heard that term? Sounds Christian, doesn't it? Disciples of Christ, right? Just like Jehovah's Witness. It sounds Christian. But Disciples of Christ is a cult. It's not Christianity. And so what the world see when a leadership of the disciples of Christ murdered, mass murdered all of his own disciples and killed himself. It's a mockery of Christianity. Satan had to laugh as they drank that Kool-Aid. He found a willing agent to make a mockery of God's people. Very, very clearly. Hitler is another one. Um, how else, again, could you get people to agree with extermination of an entire race? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Greater yet, like the Hellenistic Jews, how else did Hitler get the support of professing Christians? Because Satan had to laugh. When Christians were singing hymns in churches, drowning out the sound of trains, taking God's people from massacre. How do you get that? There has to be a power behind it. That's pure evil. <clears throat> That's not human. And so Hitler definitely, definitely <clears throat> had more than human power. Satan got a victory. So the same is going to be true of the Antichrist. But the Antichrist will be even more powerful than any of these we've seen. The Antichrist, we have no clue. Remember that. Second Thessalonians tells us we're not going to know. Until the Holy Spirit's taken away, it's not going to reveal the Antichrist. Could be living today. It's possible. He asks those questions, does the Antichrist know he's the Antichrist? I don't think he does until it's revealed. Until it's revealed. It could be a rising world leader who is doing everything with the right ideas and the right desires, but the removal of the Holy Spirit could be that one. We don't know. Okay? We don't know. But he's going to be powerful. He's going to overcome three world leaders. He's going to set himself up to be worshipped. We're going to talk more about him later. 
Uh, but very clearly, the Antichrist will get his power from Satan to perform miraculous signs. Now, number two, he's actually going to attack Jesus. Who in their right mind would do this? Right? Who in their right mind? And this is where some of this language is very important. Daniel uses a title, Prince of Princesses. That was a Semitic title for the Messiah. So they knew very clearly that this, this Antichrist was going to attack the Messiah. That's, that's wow. Uh, we know the true Antichrist will be so drunk with power that he literally will gather an army. And we're going to talk more extensively about that. And he thinks that he can stand against Jesus Christ. Right? He thinks he can stand. That's how powerful he thinks he is. Uh, but thankfully he'll be defeated. That's the good news that Daniel's vision ends with. Uh, the end of verse 25 gives another important clue. Uh, that little horn will be broken, though not by human power. Antiochus Epiphany was broken by human power. Jim Jones was broken by human power. Hitler was broken by human power. Every small A Antichrist has been broken by human power. That's going to be the difference. The Antichrist will not be broken by human power. He will be broken by the power of Jesus himself. Okay? He will be defeated. This is our encouragement. As Paul says to the uh, Thessalonians and to us, he says, Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. That's after the, the lifting of the Holy Spirit. For the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Thankfully, we end on a positive note, on the fact that we win. And I think that's what kept Daniel sane. Because these things destroyed him. These things made him so distraught that he was sick for days. But thankfully, the vision ended on an up note. Yes, there's going to be hard times. Yes, it's going to be difficult. But we know who wins. He's going to attack Jesus, but he'll be defeated. So what are our principles for today? Um, Charles Swindoll, I use many different commentaries, a lot of them. Uh, and I used Charles Swindoll this week for some things. In his commentary on Daniel, he wrote this in this chapter as a conclusion. He says, The precise fulfillment of the prophecies can reassure us that God's Word is true and dependable. Right? I've already said that. The fact that we can look back and identify the Greek Empire as that, as that goat says God's Word is dependable because that was written hundreds of years before it actually happened. And we know historically it happened. We know Antiochus Epiphanes. We know he did the sacrifice, the abomination of this desolation. We know all those things actually happened. They're historical events. And so when we see these prophecies and know they're fulfilled, wow. Because we know that this text was written because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 1948, Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And this text was dated as a copy before Antiochus Epiphanes did what he did. We know for a fact that these things happened as they were prophesied. It gives us confidence and credibility in God's, in God's prophecies. So he says, since God's promises have been fulfilled in the past, we can trust His power to take care of our present. I like that. And, and that's what I got out of this study. <clears throat> yes, God is in control. And that's what all this is about. He gives these prophecies to Daniel. He lets Daniel know what's happening but he also lets him know we win, right? Evil will not win. God will triumph. And so knowing that, knowing that that power is there, we know that he has power to take care of our things in our present life today that we struggle with and suffer with. And so we can take courage from that, from a study like this. All right? Anything you take from the study that I didn't bring out? Since I left a little time, didn't go over this time a little better. Okay, we're going to keep moving on. If you want to read chapter 9 next week, uh, for next week, Lord willing, we will be there. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But we are getting into some really neat things that, again, you want to study because we're going to start talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's coming. Uh, we'll study more about Antiochus Epiphanes and more of the parallels between him and the ultimate Antichrist. Uh, and so, again, thankfully we know how it ends. Antichrist loses. All right, Jim, what's our song number? 31, why don't you stand with us, please?